But uh, I, I gave you three pages today. There's a lot more to this, and we'll get, continue to go through it, and I'll pass things out as we get to them rather than page, giving you the, the rest of it at once. Um, but uh, let's pray, and then we'll get going on, on principles of Bible study. Father, Lord, I thank you for this day. I thank you, Lord, for uh, just being our Heavenly Father. And, Lord, a Heavenly Father that's present uh, with us all the time, where we're at, going through what we are going through, and working through the things in our lives that we we need your help with because we can't uh, survive uh, the streets of life without you, Father, and we, we need you. And uh, I pray, Father, today that as we come to your word and we look into it and we begin to piece together these uh, Bible study uh, characteristics or techniques or, or different things that help us understanding in the understanding of your word, I pray, Father, you would just implement them or imprint them in our minds that we might remember them, we might take it home, that we might use them. Father, not to gain knowledge, but Lord, to, uh, to gain a, a deeper relationship with you um, and understanding you, understanding who you are, who we are, what you want to do with us, and, uh, and what your word says about all of it, Lord. And we just want to give you praise and glory in all things. Amen. Um, I praise God. I was talking to uh, uh, Margaret today, and she said she's got a daughter, I think, in Wichita. Is that right? Yeah. And over. So she's safe. All her family's safe from that mess. I don't know if you guys saw that or not. Uh, the tornadoes, I've seen 50 videos on it in the last 24 hours. It's amazing, the power of nature. And uh, I was out running with uh, Matt Kerr, I think, the other day, and we were talking, and we were talking about that. And just the... Um, how nature makes you feel so small. It's like, I don't know if you saw that thing come down and all the debris and stuff just being flung and picked up. It was just, it's amazing how small we are. But uh, we have a big God. So anyway, so we're going to get into principles of Bible study. The thing about understanding principles, there's principles that we do in everything, right? We have principles of learning. We have principles of uh, athletes use certain principles and guidelines by which they improve their skills and their you know, if I want to get faster, if I want to go further, if I want to do things, and there's certain principles that I try to apply or implement in my life that will get me there. And it's the same way with Bible study. There's certain things when you learn certain things about the Bible, certain key phrases, key words, context, things like that, that, that it comes together. You'll see how it just simply fits together. Um, it's not a difficult book in, in uh to, to uh, understand the challenge that people have with it is in believing it sometimes. And that's the, that paragraph at the top, without using <clears throat> principles of Bible study, heresy and bad doctrine will dominate the beliefs of God's people. <clears throat> Satan will use bad doctrine to deceive the believer. And he does that in Genesis 3, 1 through 7. He did that with Eve. Um, he did that in the garden uh, where he came in and he twisted scripture. We've seen that recently. We've looked at that passage where Satan comes in as the serpent and he manipulates and changes and, 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 you know, confuses her because um, he twisted the word of God. And, uh, and so she was deceived. These principles are not inspired. However, they have been proven by saints throughout the ages to help people learn and understand the Bible. Um, you should add to, the, add to these principles uh, as God begins to teach you how to study the Bible. Not only is there certain principles, but you do see things as you read through the Bible that sort of connect different points of it. And you'll, you'll learn things just as you continue to read. But the first thing I, I want to talk about, and that's not in your notes here, is belief. We live in a day and age where people are lied to every day, every day, by all sides, all over. The, the living lies today, trying to figure out what the truth is amidst the lies, is, is an absolutely challenging thing. And I want to go over to 1 Thessalonians real quick. Um, and this is also why it's so important to understand some of these principles, because when you understand the principles of Bible study and how it's fit together, it's a lot easier to fend off these lies as they come your way spiritually. Like when people bring bad doctrine your way, it's a lot easier to sort of figure out why they're, they're talking about it, what, what they're saying, where they're off and what have you. And, and I want to talk about belief because it's going to start with believing. Um, you know, we get saved through belief. We, through receiving Christ and believing those things. We looked at that in John a couple weeks ago about receiving and believing uh, the gospel. 
And in 1 Thessalonians chapter 2, verse 8, Paul writes to this church and he says, So being affectionately desirous of you, we were willing to have imparted unto you not the gospel of God only, but also our own souls, because you were dear unto us. For you remember, brethren, our labor and travail for laboring night and day, because, uh, because we would not uh, be uh, chargeable unto any of you, we preached unto you the gospel of God. Um, ye are witnesses, and God also, how holy and just, justly and unblameably we behaved ourselves. Um, uh, we behaved ourselves among you that believe. As you know, how we exhorted and comforted and charged every one of you as a father doth uh, his children. Right? So you keep going down in verse 12. He says that ye would walk worthy of God. So this was their desire. This is why they did what they did. Because they wanted God's people not just to get saved, not just to accept Christ, but that, that ye would walk worthy of God who hath called you unto his kingdom and glory. He wanted them to walk the walk with Christ. You know, he wanted them to walk worthy of God's calling in their life, that you would walk worthy of God who hath called you to his kingdom and glory for this cause also. So this is what they did. This is why they did it. And this is why they're thankful for these people. For this cause also thank we God without ceasing. Because when you receive the word of God, which ye heard of us, ye received it not as the word of men, but as it is in truth, the word of God, which effectually worketh also in you that believe. And we'd looked at that verse when I was talking about vision here a couple of months ago now, um, about believing. It works in you that believe. If you don't believe it, it don't work. That's the, that'd be the contradiction to that, right? That'd be the, the, the reverse. It's not going to have an effectual work in you if you come to the Word of God and you don't believe it, which tells me it's a challenge sometimes. That's a challenge. That's an issue with us. He wouldn't say it if it wasn't. There are people that get saved that believe the Word of God, right? But there are also people out there that don't believe the Word of God. And the, the companion passage to this you can find in 2 Thessalonians chapter 2. Just jump over a book, same chapter. Jump to your right a couple pages, 2 Thessalonians chapter 2. And this verse describes today what we live in. This is the culture and the society and the world in which we live. This, this defines our, what you see every day. Um, look at verse, let's look at verse 10. And this is dealing with the end times, it's specifically dealing with the Antichrist when he comes. But you also see certain traits here that exist today. And really these traits have existed since Genesis 3 and before. These are not new traits, this is not a new thing. But it seems more magnified today. So verse 10 it says, And with all deceivableness of unrighteousness in them that perish, because they receive not the love of the truth, that they might be saved. So he's talking about the Antichrist, right? If you go back to verse 9, he says, Even him whose coming is after the working of Satan. So after the working of Satan, he's going to come. He's going to work just like Satan works. Nothing's new. Nothing's different. He's going to come in. He's going to deceive just like he did in Genesis 3. With all power and signs and lying wonders, and with all deceivableness of unrighteousness in them that perish, because they receive not the love of the truth. And here's the deal. You have this group of people here that he deceives that have received not the love of the truth. Well, we know that the truth is the word of God, right? We know that John 17, 17 says, sanctify them through thy word. Thy word is truth. We've looked at that. We've studied that. The word of God is truth, defines itself as truth. Christ says, I am the way, the truth, and the life, John 14. He's the truth. The word of God's the truth that they might be saved. But look at this, for this cause, and this is what happens, if you don't receive the word of God, if you don't receive it, and for thus, for thus cause, God, this cause, God shall send them strong delusion that they should believe a lie. You see, the problem is when you reject God's truth, God presents you with the word of God. He's given you the truth of the gospel in Christ. He's given you the truth by which to live our lives by. But the decision to believe it is yours. Now, this is an interesting thing, and it doesn't seem maybe that deep, but I think it's deeper than we think it sometimes. Belief is a conscious decision. It's not just something that, that, you, that you do or that you are. You have to choose 
to believe things. And we believe things based upon whether we accept them as truth or not. If I don't accept it as truth, I shouldn't believe it, right? But look around at the world today and look at what's going on, right? People choose to believe things that factually, numerically, biologically, whatever it might be, are clearly not true. Clearly not true. And yet, they have chosen to believe those things. And you cannot argue people out of what they believe. You just can't do it because something inside of them has chosen. They made a decision to believe a lie, but they don't believe it as a lie. They believe it as truth and they change their lives. They go down these roads that destroy them because of what they have chosen to believe as truth. That's the danger of the deception, right? Eve, she was what? Deceived. Yes. The word uses, the word that it uses is beguiled. And that word, you find that word in the Bible, I think six times, maybe seven, it's right, six or seven times. But every time you use, see it used, it's used in a way where somebody is deceived to the point that they believe what they are doing is true. That's deception, Right. It's not that they concocted a lie and just decided there is some deception there that was so strong that they believed it. Um, the one that comes to mind right off the bat is Jacob and Leah, Jacob and Leah and Rachel, right? Jacob goes and he works for this guy for seven years, however long it was to, to marry Rachel. And in the midst of the night, he slips in Leah, right? He slips in this gal that is not Rachel. It's not who he's working for her. Or not uh, Jacob and who is it? Leah and Rebecca. Is it Rachel? Am I messing up? Is Rachel? And so you, he comes in and and he get he so he goes to sleep with right this woman that he thinks is his wife. Right? They go and they consummate the marriage. He thinks Leah is Rachel. So he's deceived to the point that he didn't know what he was doing. He didn't do that intentionally. It's a deception, right? So that's what happens when you're beguiled. That's why, like with Eve, hey, listen, she, she was tricked. I mean, I'm not saying she didn't look at it and make a decision because she did inevitably make the decision to eat the fruit, right? But at the same time, she believed what Satan said, and it motivated her, moved her in that lie to, to destroy the life that God had given her. Adam, on the other hand, doesn't say he was deceived. He saw it, but he did it anyway to save his wife. He chose. So there's a difference between the two, and you can study that out. But, but anyway, um, I say that all to say this. We live in a world today where the lies are rampant, and some of them are incredibly convincing. Some of them are ludicrous, but some of them are incredibly convincing. And so uh, you have to be really careful. And you'll notice in verse um, uh, 11, it says, for this cause, because they've not received the love of the truth, for this cause, God shall send them strong delusion that they should believe a lie, that they all might, and this is strong, this is powerful, that they all might be damned to believe not the truth but had pleasure in unrighteousness. And there's what the, the problem is, right? The, at one point, you, you reject, God gave this to you, and you reject it. You don't receive it. You say no. So then God's response is, okay, believe whatever you want. I'll, I'll, I'll give you something. You can, if you're not, this is the truth. You're going to walk away from it. You're the one, you're going to be damned. I'm telling you, right? And that's what God's saying. He's going to send a lie that they're going to believe. And there's a million of them out there he sent. It's just when you start rejecting the truth, God says, okay, do what you want to do. Live like you want to live. Unto unrighteousness and unto your own destruction is where that's going to take you. Truth is always there. It doesn't change. But at the same time, this is a very, when you walk away from the book, you're, you're playing on shallow ground. And so there's so much out there. So come to it with belief. Um, 
believe it. So point one, that was a side note. Um, that's the preacher part of me that wants to just, just go off on society's lies right now. But um, establish the context of the passage. This is the most important, one of the most important things, is understanding the context of the passage. Uh, in, under point A, this is a principle that is rooted in common sense and courtesy, right? Have you guys ever been misquoted? I have been. Horribly so sometimes. Horribly so. Um, I've, I've been misquoted. I've also said things that they've quoted me on, people have, may have quoted me on, but were taken out of the context of what I was saying, right? So you can be misquoted completely, or you can say something that you meant to say, but that context and when you meant to say it has been taken out of context and is twisted to say something that you didn't mean. I've had that happen too. Um, and and it's, the Bible is the same way. Don't take a verse out of context. And we'll look at a couple of these. Understanding the context of the passage. And we'll get to this, the context. But when I speak of context, I'm speaking about things like different applications of Scripture, right? Looking at it from the historical application of Scripture, or the doctrinal application of the Scripture, or, or the inspirational aspect of Scripture. How do you apply those things? And we'll get to all those in the next few weeks. Um, Who's it written to? Was it written to the Jews? Was it written to the Gentiles? Was it written to the church? Right? Who was it written to? And at the time it was written. Who's it written to? Who does it apply to today? And, and how does it fit together to work together is one book that expands the ages of how God dealt with people at different times. How does it pull together and expand all of those different ages, or we would call them dispensational times where God dealt with Adam in a certain way, and then he dealt with somebody else different. He dealt with the nation of Israel, and he dealt with the church, and those different times. How does it don't, you know, and those types of things. So, and we'll get to all those. So context is incredibly important, and you find that by understanding who he wrote it to, right, and how to apply it in some basic ways. So we're going to spend some time on, uh, on doing that. I'll give you, um, I'll give you just a, an example of this back in, go to, there's several verses there, but if you go to, uh, Job 12, a couple comparison passages, Job 12 and verse six. So if I take this passage and I just want to take it and just say, I'm going to apply it to my life, it's not going to send you down the right road, right? So Job 12, so I'm reading, so I'm just reading one day, right? And I'm reading through the book of Job. I'm thinking, well, this all applies to me. And I come across verse six, the tabernacles of robbers prosper and they that provoke God are secure into whose hand God bringeth abundantly. I'm in the wrong business folks, <laughs> right? I mean, so you see what I'm saying? If I just take that verse and I just say, wow, I need to go find a new career. You know, I need to turn the badge in and go another direction here because clearly I'm fighting the wrong fight here, right? You can't do that. You can't just take a verse and apply that without understanding who is Job, without understanding what's the book of Job about without understanding that Job is a picture of the nation of Israel in the tribulation period of time. These are the different things that you've got to grab and understand the context of the passage. Because truthfully, in that time, that's an accurate statement. It is for them at that point. But their outcome is what's not listed here. How I was talking, I was talking, we had a case a while back. It's a, it was an amazing case. There's a guy, and, and he got, he's been busted several times in Kansas throughout the nation. They call him. You may have heard about him. Actually, you may have made the news. Uh, they call him the, um, uh, was it the Bob the Builder Bandit? Have you heard of this guy? So what he does basically forges checks. So he, he'll, he'll fake an ID for somebody. He'll find, I don't know how he's doing it all. I haven't looked into all this one. There's another one I did figure. But he'll, he'll find these, he'll forge these checks, and he'll fake an ID as the owner of the check. He'll walk into the bank with a bogus ID, 
and he will withdraw money out of their accounts, right? Because he'll make, he's making the bogus IDs and somehow he's grabbing their account numbers all over the country. So he got busted up in Leavenworth here a year ago. But they call him Bob the Builder Bandit because he always wears, every time he comes in with a big orange helmet and like a yellow vest. Well, at least the guy's creative, you know, I'll give him that. But I mean, the guy has cashed out hundreds of thousands of dollars. He's, he's good at what he does, right? But the, the end game of that is a different story. He even got bonded out in Leavenworth, went out, did it again, got busted somewhere else, and flew himself back to Leavenworth to go to court. So he didn't get a warrant for his arrest. And this guy's got it down, man. You know what I mean? I mean, he's a thinker. So, it, <laughs> so he's, but anyway, so yeah, this guy, he probably fits that, right? Yeah. Tabernacles are robbers and prosper, and they that provoke God are secure. Um, into whose hand God bringeth the money. Well, you know, let him believe a lie if he wants to. But go over to Psalms. Go over to Psalms chapter 73. Psalm 73, verse 3. 73, 3, I think. 3, 13. 3, 3 through 16. 3. For I was getting envious at the foolish when I saw the prosperity of the wicked. So here's the context of this, right? So Asaph's writing, he says, For I was envious at the foolish when I saw the prosperity of the wicked. For there are no bands in their, in their death, but their strength is firm. They are not in trouble as other men, neither are they plagued like other men. Therefore, pride compasseth them about as a chain. Violence covereth them as a garment. Their eyes stand out with fatness. They have more than heart could. They have more than heart could wish. They are corrupt and speak wickedly concerning oppression. They speak loftily. They set their mouth against the heavens, and their tongue walketh through the earth. Therefore, his people return hither, and waters of a full cup are wrung out of them. And they say, How doth God know? And is there knowledge in the Most High? Behold, these are the ungodly who prosper in the world. They increase in riches. Verily, I have cleansed my heart in vain and washed my hands in innocency. For all the day long have I been plagued and chastened every morning. If I say I will speak thus, behold, I should offend against the generation of thy children. When I thought to know this, it was too painful for me. So he's saying, man, these guys are out there living high on the hog, doing all this junk. They're all corrupt. They're all, you know, seem to be secure and safe. And he says, here I am living for God. And I have cleansed my heart. I've, I've walked in innoc innocency. I've done this stuff. And I'm, it's making me question what it is I'm doing in life, right? But then verse 17, he says, until I went into the sanctuary of God, then I understood I their end. You see, because you can look all kinds of successful. I mean, there's some stuff going on today. You've been watching this whole, I, I, I've tried not to, but you can't really stay away from it. The Johnny Depp, Amanda Heard fiasco. I mean, those guys, how is this making, how is this making this kind of news? I mean, I, there's a part of me that says this whole thing's just set up. This, there's just can't, this can't be real. This is so stupid. It can't be real. You know, but look at those guys. Look at how successful they are. And then look at the lives they live. They're absolute wrecked ships. And yet they have all this stuff. You know, they seem all successful. But in the end, it all collapses. And in the end of life, what do they have? No relationship with God. An absolute, you know, mess on earth. It's just it's just horrible. So anyway. And jump over to Psalms 51.11. So here's another one. And this is one that's easy to be, to be confused when we're dealing with uh, people saying that you can lose the Holy Spirit of God. Psalms 51.11. Somebody's there if they want to read that. I'll go over Ephesians. Cast me not away from thy presence, and take not thy Holy Spirit from me. Well, that's a pretty bold statement, wasn't it? Yep. Take not thy Holy Spirit from me. Well, what you're going to find in Ephesians chapter 1 
is a different statement. Ephesians chapter 1, verse 13, after you accept Christ as your Savior, he says this, or verse 12, that we should be to the praise of his glory who first trusted in Christ, in whom ye also trusted after that ye heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation, in whom also after that ye believed, ye were sealed with the Holy Spirit of promise, which is the earnest of our inheritance until the redemption of the purchased possession unto the praise of his glory. We are sealed with the Holy Spirit of promise. And yet Psalms 51 says, David's praying, he's like, hey, don't take the Holy Spirit of God from me. Was that optional back then? Was that, it was an option back then. They didn't have guarantees in the Old Testament under the Jewish, under God dealing with the Jew that way. They had no guarantee to maintain the Holy Spirit within them. They could come and they could come and go. He could come and go. They could stand and fall. They could, they could glorify God, not glorify God, which would be impactive on their life and their eternity with God based upon works based upon what they did. So it's a faith and works difference with the Jewish in the Old Testament. But under Christ, he dealt with all that sacrifice. He dealt with all that stuff in himself. And now when we accept him, we're sealed. See, it's a different age. They still had the option of having the Holy Spirit, but they also had the option of losing him if they chose to walk against God. We don't. That's not an option. We choose to walk against God. The Holy Spirit's still there. He's got other means of correction. He, he will deal with us, but it's different, right? So he, we, he purchased us. We are his. We were born. We, we've looked at that unto him. But if you don't know that, if you don't understand the context, just the difference in the Old Testament and the New Testament, right? Just those two contexts. If I take that Psalms 51 verse and I want to throw it in somebody's face without balancing out with Ephesians chapter 1 in our age, you see how easy it is to, to even take the Bible and make it say, it says it. <laughs> Why does it say it? It says it because at that time, that's what God was doing. But I'm not living in that time. God's doing things a little differently now, you see. And you've got to understand that and see that kind of stuff. Otherwise, it does get confusing. So, um, point B, false teaching is the result of misplaced truth. It's taking the Psalms 51.1 and misplacing it in a different time. That God's dealing with a different group of people. He was dealing with the Jews. He's dealt with the Gentiles. He's dealing with the church. So you see now in the church in Ephesians what God says in comparison to what he was doing with the Jews back in, in the Old Testament. So don't misplace Psalms 51 and not understand where it fits within the time. Don't misplace it. Um, text without context is, is, is a con. That's a good... That's a good phrase. I can't remember. It was Alan Shelby. Somebody said that. Alan Shelby said that. Um, that's a good phrase. It's kind of, somebody's just twisting the truth, you know. Um, and that's it, point one. People have twisted Scripture out of context since the New Testament times. Second Peter chapter 3, the verses here on the page, verse 15 and 16, it says, An account that the long-suffering of our Lord is salvation, even as our beloved brother Paul also, according to the wisdom given unto him, hath written unto you, as also in all his epistles, speaking in them of these things, in which are some things hard to be understood, which they that are unlearned and unstable rest, as they do also the other scriptures, unto their own destruction. They twist, they wrestle the scriptures, right? They, they take them and they don't understand them. They don't understand the context. They lay aside Bible study principles and they just make them say what they want to say where they want to say them to have the effect they want to have, right? Words are an incredible thing. I watched this guy. Uh, he's a Christian. This guy named Chad Wright. He's a former Navy SEAL. He's an ultra runner, and I watched some of his stuff. He's, he's kind of hard to put up with. He's not. He's, he's pretty hardcore. But he's one of the things he says, he's got this whole deal on how he gets through these long runs and how he got through SEAL training and all this stuff. Well, he, uh, he talks about the power of the spoken word. He talks about um, when you say something to yourself, how much impact that has more than thinking it in your head. It's kind of like written, writing it, the same thing. When you write, it has a similar effect. And he tells a story about doing this run. It was that they have these runs called these last man standing runs or 
backyard runs where they'll run four point, they'll do, they'll start off together and you got to run 4.17 miles in an hour. All right. And then you have whatever time you got left at the end of that run, you can rest, you can eat, you can do whatever. And then one hour later, everybody toes the line again and they take off for their second lap. And they do that until the last guy standing. They'll do that for 200 miles. That's just on and on and on. And just a mental game. And he was talking about, he was talking about this guy that had the most he had run. He showed up at one of these ultras and, uh, he says this guy showed up and he'd run like a 10K. It was the most he'd ever run. It was like a 10K, which is 6.2 miles, I think. So he'd done a 10K before and he wanted to run 100 miles and he thought this would be the way to do it, right? To do it. You get a break every hour. Four miles in an hour is not that. You can do that. I mean, you know. So this kid, young guy, shows up and, and Chad talks about kind of taking him under his wing. And... So he was telling him, he did, did a couple laps, they'd done like, they were up to like 10 miles, I think, at that point. And he could tell the guy was like wearing out. And so he says, he says, I went up to him, he says, man, I just want you to say two things. He says, I want you to say out loud, I will not quit. Just say it. And he, he said, the guy goes, I won't quit. And no, 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 no. You get up and you say, I will not quit. Everybody can hear you. Because once you say it, there's a commitment with that, right? And there is more of a commitment when you say something. But you're committing to yourself. And he says, and he says, so he does. And he says, I want you to say one more thing. I won't die in the chair. Meaning, you're not going to stop sitting in this chair we're sitting in right now at this break. You're going you're gonna to die out there on one of these laps is where you're going to quit. When, it, when it's over, it's over. But it's going to be over out there, not here. Don't die in the chair. And so it's okay. I won't die in the chair. So he says the kid got his hundred miles that way. Yeah, he went out and did it. They did it. They were running, you know, every hour. I think you can do a hundred miles in 24 hours that way. I think is how they plan on doing that. So they're out there 24 hours. He gets his hundred miles and the kid's like, Hey man, I made it, man. I did it. I did the hundred miles. And he goes, I'm done. He says, Chad's like, no, you're not, man. No, you're not. Why? Because you said you ain't dying in a chair. So he did what he accomplished. So they take off on this, this lap, one more lap. And he says he's about three, 300 yards in, and Chad looks over and he says, all right, man, you're done. You did your 100 miles, and you didn't die in a chair. He says, so he was, yeah, I'm done. So he turned around and walked back. It was all over. <laughs> but, but, he, but he did what he said, right? He did what he said he'd do. He accomplished his 100-mile goal. And it's, it, there's a powerful thing in, in speaking the truth, speaking the word. Um, and, and knowing it, the word of God is powerful. And it says, I don't know where I got off on that. I had a point I was going to reel that back in somewhere and I totally lost it in the excitement of the story that happens sometimes. So what happens when you got, when you're lacking oxygen or something from, I don't know what, when you get old, maybe is that part of it? my wisdom left me. But, uh, anyway, this will always be a common problem. This is, it will be. In fact, the common problem is, as you get older, you forget things. Point two, this will always be a common problem within the local church. People will take scripture in the local church and make it say what they want to say. They just will. Um, I've seen it in all kinds of scenarios. I've seen it with people. Um, who are we going? Acts chapter 20. I've seen it with people. Um, I, it, I mean, it's just... I, I saw somebody one time, and this was back in 1989, whenever we were living in California, I guess. When was it, 89? Um, so I saw a guy out there. That, there was this book that came out in 1988 called 88 Reasons Why Christ Has Come Back in 88. Some of you old guys remember that, John. And um, it had all these reasons why Christ was going to come back that year. And I, and I met a guy out there. There was so into that. He had like 50 kids. I mean, I, I got a lot of kids. Yeah, I think he had more kids than I got. But he had a bunch of kids. And he, yeah, we didn't have 50 kids. But anyway, he had a lot more than we got five. So that was, um, five is, eight is enough? No, five is enough. Seriously, man, five is enough. Um, so 
But he took this thing to heart. He was sold out for the Lord, right? So his brilliant idea was to continuously, you know, minister, do what he's doing. But since the Lord was coming back, fund all his ministry through charging up all these credit cards. Because, you know, the Lord's coming back anyway. He bankrupted himself with this brilliant, stupid idea, right, that, hey, I'm just going to, God must have given me these so that I might live my last year ministering Christ on, you know, Bank of America's dime. I, what, what is, how do you even logically do that? I mean, how do you even think that way, right? But the idea, the idea of God providing, right? I mean, is that not God will provide for you to minister? God will provide for your family. God will do all these things. Christ is coming back. So you see all of these ideas where in somebody's mind that gets that stuff and just twists it, you kind of see where people go down these roads, right? It's like, well, man, God's provided all this. No, you just bankrupted the rest of your life because you, you, you took something that, yeah, God will provide. God will take care of the ministry. He will take care of your family. But he doesn't say to do that by borrowing from everybody else. In fact, he says don't borrow from everybody else in several places in the Bible. So don't be, you know, entrapped to all this junk, entangled with it. So anyway, Acts chapter 20, it, it goes on in some of the most bizarre, bizarre ways. Um, Acts chapter 20, verse 28. He says, Take heed therefore unto yourselves and to all the flock over the which whole... Oh, over the which the Holy Ghost hath made you overseers to feed the church of God, which he hath purchased with his own blood. So this is, this is sort of a, a message to, uh, to the church at Ephesus, right? So he's telling them, you take over, you be an overseer. You watch this stuff. Verse 29, for I know this, that after my departing shall grievous wolves enter in among you, not sparing the flock. Also of your own selves shall men arise speaking perverse things to draw away disciples after them. Look at the church today, every church today. Why do you think we're so big on discipling people? There's several reasons. One is for their own benefit and their growth in the Lord. But the other thing is I want to make sure the person sitting in front of me has a handle on the word of God because I don't want them teaching something stupid that doesn't need to be taught in church because it's bogus. It's a protection method. It does both. It makes sure that the people that come in this church know and understand the Word of God, but also from a protection measure, it makes sure that if, if you run into something that cannot be overcome with Scripture, and you're dealing with somebody that's got some bad doctrine that they won't let go of, like eternal security issues, those basic things, you know, um, then those basic doctrines, it makes sure that everybody's on the same page. And if you're not on the same page, then maybe this isn't the place for you. And that's okay. You know, I'm not, it's not, it's not like something that's, but, but at the same time, it does protect when we disciple, we teach the word of God. Um, and we'll do things different times. So we'll sit down and discuss the word of God or we'll, people go home and we'll do studies where people are studying passages and they come back together and share what God's, what God's given them, or we'll do different Bible study methods like that. And that's important to do. Because it also teaches people how to study the Word of God and share what God's given them. But it's never going to be like this sit around and talk about religious philosophy thing. That's not what we're about. The, the book is the book. The, I don't want to walk away from the truth because of what I think. And you don't want me to walk away from the truth because of what I think. Right? I mean, I don't, you don't want me just giving you my opinion on stuff or telling stories about people running 100 miles that make no sense to anybody. You don't want that stuff. Right? You want the book. That's what it's about. So anyway, we're going to look at a couple examples. Now, some of these, these examples, uh, let's just go back. Some, I'll go back to Ezekiel 37. And these are some examples where other religions take passages of Scripture and abuse and twist them to make them say what it is that they are wanting you to believe. All right. Um, Ezekiel chapter 37. So Mormonism says in this passage that what Ezekiel is writing about in these sticks, talks about two sticks uh, here, that one of them is the Bible and one of them is the Book of Mormon. 
All right, so that is how they're, they're trying to tie that into this passage of Scripture, um, which you can't, it's not, it, it, it's not there at all. It's not just, it's just not even arguable point here, if you just look at the context of the passage. So Ezekiel chapter 37, I'm sorry, 36, and look at verse 16, and we'll just kind of run. 37. Oh, yeah, 37 verse 16, sorry. He says, um, Look at verse 15. The word of the Lord came again unto me, saying, Moreover, thou son of man, take thee one stick and write upon it for Judah and for the children of Israel, his companions. Then take another stick and write upon it for Joseph, the stick of Ephraim, and for the house of Israel and his, of his companions. And join them one to another into one stick, and they shall become one in thy hand. So they will superimpose... In that passage, that one of those sticks is the King James Bible, and one of those sticks is the Book of Mormon. Just superimpose it. They'll just throw it in there. But the Bible will define itself as to what it's talking about in the next verses. Okay? Just look at the next verses, verse 17. So what they're saying, what their doctrine is, you've got these two books, the Bible and the Book of Mormon. And we are to take those and we are to join them together and utilize them both within what we believe. That is the system, the basic system that they, they want to use. But look at verse 18. And when the children of thy people shall speak unto thee, saying, Wilt thou not show us what thou meanest by these? So here's what he means. This is what he's talking about now. Um, say unto them, Thus saith the Lord God, Behold, I will take the stick of Joseph, which is in the hand of Ephraim, and the tribes of Israel, his fellows, and will put them with him, even with the stick of Judah, and make them one stick, and they shall be one in mine hand. So you have the two sticks defined as two separate parts of the nation of Israel, which will be inevitably put back together to, again as one stick in the end. Because they're separated tribes at this time, right? You've got tribes that are apart. They have been since they went into the land. So you have these tribes that are separated. You have the different kingdoms of the nation of Israel, which are divided. And you can even find, I think it's in Numbers chapter 17, verse 2, where he takes, Moses takes a staff, a stick, for each one of those tribes, and he has them write their names on it representing one staff, one stick for each tribe of the nation of Israel. And so what he's doing here, he's, he even says, what do you mean by this stick thing? And he defines it right there in the passage. That what he's talking about, first of all, the nation of Israel is divided at this time. I want you to take this stick. I want you to take this stick. And I want you to use them as a picture to the nation of Israel. That eventually you will bring those sticks back together and that nation will be one again. That's the simplicity of that passage if you just read the passage, right? But if you don't read the rest of it, you can make them sticks be whatever you want them to be. Can't you? Well, it's just some sticks with some writing on it. One from this tribe of Israel. It doesn't say this tribe of Israel was the lost tribe of Israel in the United States and Christ came and nothing like that. Nothing like that. So... Exodus chapter 31, verse, uh, we'll just talk about this, Exodus 31, 14 to 16, your seventh-day Adventist. That talks about honoring the Sabbath day, right? That, that passage deals with honoring the Sabbath day, and, and it's a, a requirement to do that. And it was to the nation of Israel in the Old Testament. It's a different, it's a different context, a different passage than it is today. Um, John 3, verse 5. Let's jump over there real quick. You get into baptismal regeneration. That's just a, a big term that says that you have to be baptized to be saved. Um, and if you can look at John, again, if I'm going to take this passage and just make it say what it says, and I'm just going to take it. In John chapter 3, um, he says, Jesus, in verse 5, 
Jesus answered, Verily, verily, I say unto thee, except a man be born of water and of the Spirit, he cannot enter into the kingdom of God. All right? There are so many things in that verse that you need to look up and figure out what he's talking about before you make a doctrine out of that verse. I mean, there's so many things. He says in verse 5, Jesus answered, Verily, uh, verily, I say unto thee, except a man be born of water. All right? Now, if you're going to submit that water is baptism in there, if I'm going to jump baptism in there, then you have baptismal regeneration. You have baptismal salvation. Water and of the Spirit, right? Then you can't enter into the kingdom of God. But he's not talking about baptism here. There's nothing here that says he's talking about baptism. In fact, he's talking about being born. How are you born of water? Well, you're born in water. You, the water sack breaks in your mom's womb and you spit out on the floor or wherever you come out at and you're good to go, right? I mean, that's how it works. So, I mean, you're born of water. So you have to be born of water. You got to be born physically, right? But you also got to be born of the Spirit. You got to be born again. And that's the thing he's talking about. That's the context of the passage. Verse 5, Jesus answered, Verily, verily, I say unto thee, except a man be born of water and of the Spirit, he cannot enter into the kingdom of God. And, uh, and then he goes down to verse 6. He says, That which is born of the flesh is flesh. So he just defines it for you. There is your water birth. There is your flesh birth. That's born of the flesh is flesh. And that which is born of the Spirit is spirit. Right? You have a physical birth and a spiritual birth. It lays out. It, it, the Bible lays itself out. Marvel not that I said unto you, you must be born again. Well, you're born again because you were born once physically, but now you need to be born spiritually. You can see it's not hard. You just can't take one verse and insert the word baptism for water. You can't. It doesn't work that way. And so understanding those things. Um, and Ephesians chapter 1 is another big one today that we're all predestined to, and this, this is a lot deeper study than I'm going to give it, but, but in Ephesians chapter 1 deals with uh, Calvinism, uh, Reformed theology, you heard those, those um, terms a lot. But um, you look at Ephesians chapter 1 and verse 4, and he's writing, first of all, who's he writing to, right? This is a basic context thing. Who's the book written to? It's written to a church at Ephesus. You're talking to people that believe in Jesus Christ. You're talking to people that are already saved, already know the Lord. And he says this in verse 4, According as he hath chosen us in him before the foundation of the world, that we should be holy and without blame before him in love, having predestinated us unto the adoption of children by Jesus Christ to himself, according to the good pleasure of his will. So take those two verses, and if you just take those two verses, and you want to break down some of these words, you can look at words and focus on words like predestined, right, uh, is the big one, that says from before the world you were predestined to become a believer in Jesus Christ. That's how you can read that. But look at the context and look at every word. It's, it's, this isn't difficult. Again, it says this, according as, as he hath chosen who? Us. Us. Notice that? That's important. He's not talking about individuals here. He's talking about a plural group of people, right? Chosen us. So he goes on, before the foundation of the world, that we should be holy and without blame before him in love. That's what he desires the church to be. Verse 5, having predestinated who? Us. All of us. Save believers, right? He's talking about the entirety of the church. He's talking about the church, us, believers in Jesus Christ. As a whole, having predestinated us unto the adoption of children by Jesus Christ to himself, according to the good pleasure of his will. So, predestined us unto what? Adoption. Right? Well, when does that adoption happen? Salvation. <laughs> Happens at salvation. It does. We're adopted there. We're born into his family. But it also, when we are taken out, 
and we go to be with the Lord. He now has taken us up. Now, so keep reading this. <laughs> to the praise of the glory of His grace, wherein He hath made us accepted in the Beloved, in whom we have redemption through His blood, the forgiveness of sins, according to the riches of His grace, wherein He hath abounded toward us in all wisdom and prudence, having made known unto us the mystery of His will, according to His good pleasure, which He hath purposed in Himself, that in the dispensation of the fullness of times, what's the context? When it's all over. You can't leave that out. He's not talking about, he's talking about believers when it's done and what we are predestined to be when we go home to be with the Lord. The fullness of times when it's done. That in the dispensation of the fullness of times, he might gather together in one all things in Christ, both which are in heaven and which are on earth, even in him. In whom also we have obtained an inheritance, being what? Predestined according to the purpose of him who worketh all things after the counsel of his own will. So we are predestined to an inheritance which is still to become in the future. That's how that breaks down. He goes to verse 12, that we should be to the praise of his glory, his glory who first trusted in Christ. Now look at this. This is where the rubber meets the road with this passage in Calvinism. Because if you're just predestined, and you were, you were the foundation, you were, before the foundation of the world, God was going to, you were going to, you were saved regardless. You were born into this thing. Then why do you have to trust it? Because that's what he says in verse 13. In whom ye also trusted. In whom ye also. Now he's getting down to you, right? Not us anymore. He didn't say we. You did. He individualizes it here. In whom ye also heard the word of truth, so here's salvation. You heard the word of truth, the gospel of our salvation, in whom also after that ye believed, ye were sealed with the Holy Spirit of promise. So, church as a whole, God predestined. He knew it was going to happen before the foundation of the earth, and He created it, but at the same time, we still make a decision to be part of that package and to claim that inheritance and to be sealed by the Holy Spirit of God upon salvation. You don't get one without the other. They work together. And so you can't have, it's, it's, you got to read the whole passage before you get it. And, and we can't forget also, and I'm going to close with this on page one. Go back to Deuteronomy chapter 31. I'm going to close with this passage because I think it's important, especially dealing within this context, that God is sovereign and God knows what we are going to do before we do it. That does not mean, however, that we do not have a decision to make in the midst of that. Um, Deuteronomy chapter 31 is a passage that Moses is talking, and Tony's talked about this. 31 verse 20, I think, is where I'm going. So Moses is talking to God's people, and he's saying these things. He knows what's going to happen to them, right? He knows where they're going. He knows they're going to get in the land. He knows they're going to fail. He already knows this. God already knew this. And yes, God knew if you were going to trust Christ or not. But he can know that and still leave the decision up to you. That's the sovereignty of God. That's God's infinite, eternal wisdom. I don't understand that. Don't claim to. But I know it's true because look at this in verse 20. For when I shall have brought them into the land which I... Um, so God's, he's, God's talking to Moses here. He says, For when I shall have brought them into the land, which I swear unto their fathers that floweth with milk and honey, and they shall have eaten and filled themselves and wax and fat, then will they turn unto other gods and serve them and provoke me and break my covenant. And it shall come to pass when many evils and troubles are, fall, are befallen them that this song shall testify against them as a witness. For it shall not be forgotten out of the mouth of their out of the mouths of their seed, for I know their imagination which they go about even now, before I have brought them into the land which I swear. So God takes them into the land, full well knowing at the time exactly what they were going to do, wrote a song ahead of time, telling them what they were going to do, and yet they went in and did it. They made the decision to do it anyway. So that's, that's some profound godness. 
that he knows, yes, he knows who's going to get saved. He knows the last person. He knew the first person. He knows right now the last person that's going to trust Christ. He knows our future. But you still have to make a decision to accept it. That person will accept it willfully, not out of being born to it. Somebody's going to give the gospel. How would you like to be that person? Give the gospel to the last person that ever accepts Christ, and all of a sudden that trumpet blows, man, and them clouds part and we're gone. Can you imagine that? Because that's the only thing holding back is that last person to get saved. So that last soul's won. It's done. Can you imagine being that person, leading that person to the Lord, they get saved. They're, being that person is just the last one. Imagine that. But imagine being the one that gave them the gospel. You know, what an awesome thing. So anyway, we'll shut down there and I'll try to get more than past one page next week. I'll quit telling stories about running that make no sense. <laughs> yeah.